Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, as you know, today, uh, tonight is a very special evening because this will be our very last Limit Break event in, in person for 2024. Um, yeah, so l we started Limit Break in 2019 and uh, we've always had discipline-specific events to talk about our craft, basically just an excuse for people to yap on about the things that they're doing and like, you know, talk about the things that they want to talk. Uh, and finally, my time has come and I can do a UI one and it's great. So obviously I dragged uh, fellow UI nerds. Um, so I'm gonna bring them on one by one. So please cheer for all of them. So first up, we have our special guest for tonight, uh, he's a star mentor and also the creator of Game, Database, Game UI Database. It is Mr. Ed Coates. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have the amazing Leanne Bailey, who is the head of UI UX at Adam Hawk Advance. Woo! <laughs> And last and definitely not least, we have Mr. Seb Long, the person behind Player Research. I say person, the head honcho, Woo! the big boss, the big mafia man of Player Research. <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, we're going to have a lovely panel tonight where we basically chit chat about uh, what we do, how we got here, um, how the industry is on fire, and you know. <laughs> It's a, it's a good place to be at. Who knows? Anyway, I'm going to try my best not to swear because it's actually really difficult. Okay. So, first up, introductions. But please, shall we start with Ed? Would you like to tell us a little bit who you are and what do you do now? Oh, God, every time. I'm never, I'm never prepared for this. Okay, cool. Uh, so, I've been streaming now for about 12 years. Uh, I made a website called The Game of Database. Uh, um, which, if you're in New York, I'm sure you know about it. Um, it's uh, yeah, a big reference tool thing. Oh god, I'm really not good at it. <laughs> slow down, Alex. Slow, 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 slow down. down. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, I started in web basically as a web designer, which is handy for making database. Obviously, um, went into sort of um, uh, mobile games mm -hmm. for a bit. Uh, went into composing for a bit randomly, um, and uh, yeah, and then I ended up at Double Eleven, uh, which is like my big break in the industry. Uh, now Radical Forge, and I love it there. I know you also you made Game Data UI database after that. And um, yeah, sometimes <laughs> Game UI database. Yeah. Something about our database. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next we have Leanne. Would you like to say uh, introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Leanne. I've been in the industry for about as long as you have actually. I think a little bit longer, like 13 odd years. Mm -hmm. I started as a designer for a small studio making mostly Flash and Facebook games, which has aged me. Uh, and then I moved into production, and then I moved into indie development for a while, where I did pretty much every hat and roll that wasn't code or music, because I'm not very musical, unlike Ed. Uh, and then I ended up at Dan Busters for a while, making a small game called Dead Island 2. We did that. That happened. It came out. Believe the hype. <laughs> and then I ended up working at Atomfork. Uh, we started a studio about three years ago now called Atomfork Advance, where we specialize in UI, UX, and technical art outsource. Atomfork has a lot of other service lines as well in the art field. And I am now the head of department for the UI team. So I spend all of my time in meetings and <laughs> in speaking to clients to try and land contracts. So that's me now. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much, Seb. Thank you very much. Thanks, folks, for coming. I'm Seb. I'm the managing director of Player Research. We're a company specializing in player data, player psychology, and player feedback. So mm -hmm. game studios come to us, wanting to understand their players better, and put the designs crafted by lovely craftspeople in front of real players to see if the ideal experience, the, object, the creative experience that they're imagining when they close their eyes is what manifests in real players when they actually play with no other instructions. Uh, I did a degree in human-computer interaction design, which is a big mouthful that means the intersection between humans and technology. And I've ever since that been focused on games as a creative space. Uh, it's my 14th or 13th or 14th year, so similar sort of tenure in the games industry as these guys. The first six years was as a researcher, where I worked on about 200 games across all genres, platforms, and audiences. And a couple of years growing the business as an international project manager, growing our business in another country, and now managing director for the last uh, six years, I think. Amazing. Uh, leading a team of 20. 
Yeah, thank you so much for that. And a quick intro for myself. Hello, I'm Anissa Sanusi. I am the founder of Limit Break. However, my actual day job, because people think Limit Break is my day job, it is not. <laughs> um, my actual day job is I'm a currently I'm a UI UX freelancer. So I work in um, I've been dabbling in tech and also in games. Currently, I'm working with two separate uh, video games companies and also doing Limit Break on the side. So. What I want to say, wanted to be clear about the panel tonight is that we're all actually um, representative of very different parts of UI UX, which I think is a pretty cool thing. So for me, um, I'm, I'm a freelancer. I used to work in studios, but now I freelance because I really enjoy the flexibility and the choice. You know, um, I always said I want a four-day work week, so I was like, oh, I'm going to freelance. I'm going to choose my own hours. Now I work six days in five days. <laughs> Good job, Anissa. So, and then we have Ed, who I would say is in the more traditional role of being a embedded UI uh, designer within a bigger studio, and, you know, and you're working with multiple projects in that one studio. And then we have Leanne, who is working in an agency, in an outsource agency, where they obviously have clients that are video games companies, So, and she's like handling a, a bunch of UI UX people under her. And then we have Seb, who does the UR part of it, you know, as you know, some companies do have internal um, internal. Uh, teams doing the research. Um, however, not all companies have the luxury of running a team like that. So now we have companies like Sebs who does literal player research for you. Mm -hmm. So I want to say all of us, we could cover a wide range of, say, one or two topics that we have here. So um, we will have a Q&A session to, at the end. Uh, however, if anyone... If at any point when we're talking, if you have this sudden urge to say something, you can totally raise up your hand. We welcome any any comments from, from all of you. We do have a walking mic, uh, so you will have to talk into the mic. So if you interrupt us, make sure you're ready. Okay, awesome. So let's start with uh, some, uh, I don't know, do you want to start to talk about like the industry, the state of the current industry and your thoughts on it? I'm going big at the yeah, so. like, go, ahead, go, go big or go home, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say like most of you, can I see a, like a, you know, a show of hands, are you, are you a UI designer? Yes, no. Cool, nice, really good turnout. Are any of you game designers or just someone in the industry but not doing UI? <laughs> oh, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, that's the other half, amazing. So it's kind of like 50-50 split, like 50 UI people and 50... You are interested people, I want to say. Um, how many of you are currently in the industry? Everybody, amazing. How many of you are worried about your current status in the industry? Very honest, thank you. Right, yeah, so it is very interesting, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, how, how, do you, how do you feel about it as someone who's, you know, you, you've been in the industry quite recent, haven't you, in yeah. comparison? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of terrified, obviously. Uh, not not just as like a, a practitioner, but also as a mentor. Obviously, like seeing a lot of people come up to me and say like, how to get in the industry, how to you know. Um, my talk, I'm doing a talk at EGX next week. I usually do a talk about getting into the industry, and I purposefully didn't make it about that because it's you know, you know I feel it's uh, disingenuous to to lie to people and say this is what you can do to get a job mm. because you know at the end of the day you have all this stuff that you can do but then the last bit of it is this roll of the dice that you know and it really just feels like that at the moment like you know people are losing their jobs people you know the jobs aren't out there or even secure you know kind of thing so it, it's terrifying and then you've got AI on top of that mm. uh, you know and I you know I I'm fairly confident uh, I mean, I say I was, I was confident before, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, I think UX feels like the last bastion of, you know, security against that because it feels like that's something that AI will struggle with the most. UX specifically. Yeah. Mm. Why um, is that? Because it needs a human touch, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, because it's, it's more of a psychology thing. And I think it's so specific for every game. Every, every problem is so specific. And, and not only that, like, you know, the problems that you're trying to solve aren't always uh, obvious, you know, to even yeah. the person designing. You don't know. So, like, you could ask an AI, like, you know, how do I solve this problem? But then you have to describe the problem. And a lot of people don't get to that point, mm. you know, at the very start of the project anyway. And by the time you've gotten to the problem, you've already done a ton of work. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I think... UX is, but as I say, we don't know. In the future, you know, there could be a robot 
called George sitting beside you <laughs> going like, hey, hello, Edward, why do we fix this problem kind of thing? And, you know, and uh, I mean, they're quite nice, actually. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's UX design because of the, the human touch, the human interaction yeah. part of it. And as much as we figured out people, they surprise us constantly sure. all the time. Yeah. But also the other avenue that still feels relatively untouched by AI at the moment is implementation. Mm. So the actual building blocks of the UI, when you implement it in engine, be that... Unity or Unreal off the shelf or like a proprietary engine mm. that at the moment a, we haven't solved with robots. Thank goodness. So yeah. long may that continue. But yeah, it is. Uh, it's a difficult time in the industry. It's not the first time the industry has been on fire like this, mm -hmm. but it is for mm -hmm. a long time the the first time it's been like this. It does yeah. feel like there has been a lot of shrinkage happening, mm -hmm. and it does feel a lot like the industry is moving to. And I think we talked about this earlier. It's mm -hmm. The the Hollywood gig economy yeah. is how it feels the industry is kind of moving towards. Where it used to be the case that we would have these big massive studios that would make everything in house, and incidentally that is what Hollywood used to be like as well. Mm -hmm. And then it changed and it flipped, and now it's much smaller core studio mm -hmm. offerings outsourcing a lot more mm -hmm. of the work. So they're bringing in a lot more specialists in the different fields to make the games, which is what Hollywood does now. No, nothing's done all in-house with one studio. Mm -hmm. You're outsourcing all of these different resources. So it feels like what we're seeing, and certainly in the last 12 months, there has been an explosion mm -hmm. in our outsource houses have doubled in the last 12 months alone. Mm -hmm. So if audio almost certainly is, has the same numbers. Mm -hmm. Design probably also sees the same things, code supply as well. So there is a lot more opportunities in that area but the traditional studio model, it feels like that has shrunk to a point where maybe we won't go back to having these massive EA, massive Ubisoft mm. studios, and now more mm. smaller focus teams, more outsource support on them. Mm. Which means game credits are going to get longer and longer and longer <laughs> because each studio comes with an extra bit of credits that needs to go in there. <laughs> And Seb, so how, how have you feel um, things have changed in the last few years? Echoing a lot of the points here, right? There's uh, big pressure on headcount, a lot of folks moving from fixed costs to uh, flexible costs. So as you say, partnering with more without sources or changing the contractual nature of folks working inside their studios. For folks looking to make their way in the games industry and to move on, I guess it, it means how do we as folks with experience of that help you to understand what that means for your career, for your professional life, for your stability? What does that mean for things like pricing your time and searching for a job in that particular space? I'd echo, definitely echo one of Ed's points, though, that UX does feel like it has a good handle on this in particular because of our uh, proximity to the psychology of players, which is a sort of unknowable thing and very unpredictable thing, influenced by a zeitgeist and a changing market, um, but also to the, the politics internal to studios. We are part of that decision-making infrastructure of the game design decision-making, mm. which makes us essential to that process. Um, and one would hope closer to indispensable to the making of a great game. Yeah, I wouldn't be too worried about robots taking over my job because <laughs> half of my job is talking to people and robots can't really do mm -hmm. that. Sure, ChatGPT can, but like in, in the ways that matter, they're really not that good, you know. Um, I know there's a lot of, if you go on online, you'll see like prompts where like, you know, create this window, create this and that, and then it just makes it for you. You still need someone to go through that because, you know, mm -hmm. every single piece of video game that you make is super different mm -hmm. um, and your clients are different, your user needs are different, so you still need a person mm -hmm. to look at it and fix it. Um, but yeah, so... One of the things that uh, people ask me about, you know, how I feel about the, the stability of the industry is that currently it's not, to be very, very frank. And I think, you know, we don't want to raise people's hopes for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. um, and what I tell people is that as UI UX practitioners, we are in this amazing um, space where we are also in the tech industry. You know, that's this whole other industry that we can tap into. In fact, it's not just tech, literally any industry that uses tech if you think about it. So you could go into health, you could go into, I don't know, the, the things that are in cars, um, just so many different options. Um, like I said, I myself went uh, freelancing in tech for a little bit and I was in hospitality. Um, and that was super interesting. And I, I had my own version of um, imposter syndrome because my entire uh, career has been video games. Like, would I be good for this? 
the core principles of it is exactly the same, you know? Like, once you do it, like, everything just kind of falls into place. The only difference, I would say, is your clients. They're slightly different from video games people, and that's it. Um, but I want to say also, you know, on, on that note of, like, re like, reaching outside of your core video games, you know, there's a role for... Um, agencies and outsourcing, mm -hmm. you know, um, so player research is an, a research facility yep. and uh, Atom Park also does uh, outsourcing. Is that, do you think there's, like, there are, like you said, more opportunities um, in, in outsource houses? For sure. And there's, there's, like I say, there's lots of opportunities for UI. If, you, if this is your field that you've chosen, mm -hmm. UI and UX design is applicable across so many different avenues of life and you interact with it all the time when you use the self-checkout, when you use the self-serving coffee machine, like all of those screens have to be designed by somebody, mm -hmm. right? And that, those button prompts and smoothing out those interactions. So there's lots of opportunities, not just in games, but like branching out across all different industries, whether that's finance, banking, government, coffee machines, like it's, <laughs> uh, it's all there. We can work in any of those fields. And like I said, with the industry turning the way that it is, it does feel like this outsource opportunity and even Bradford is like you know some of their work is in-house some of their work is work mm -hmm. for hire and they yeah, do code yeah. as well more and more studios are pulling that mm -hmm. like out of their hat and be like yep yeah, we're gonna do our own games in-house but also we're gonna have this outsource offering as well mm -hmm. so and it's like you said like the people are the only difference like the the stuff that you do when you're figuring out how it needs to interact you're figuring out what those buttons need to look like that is the same whether it's for a video game or, or anything else. But the people that you interact with are different. Like, you can't, you could say to a games client, it's like, oh, we're going to go through this now and do a juice pass and make sure everything's really juicy and bouncy and nice. You say that to someone in finance, they might look at you like you're a bit weird and not understand what... Their loss, to be fair. It's their, it is their <laughs> loss. If they don't understand what juicing is, it's their loss kind of thing. But that's the only difference is then that learning to communicate and something that I think UXs are mm. always very good at is figuring out who it is that they're working with and how you communicate with them. Mm. I've always thought um, the like, other, in other industries could benefit a lot from having U uh, game UI people mm -hmm. involved because we know how to onboard people spectacularly. Yeah. We know, we're, we're so good at that and, um, you know, and we know how to make it fun, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of, you know, like a bank, I, I, I mean, Banking apps, for example, they, you know, <laughs> UX alone is pretty bad, but like, you know, uh, I mean, that worst one is pretty fun, I suppose, in some cases, but like, yeah, I mean, I think um, game UI people could bring a lot to like other, you know, the checkout in Sainsbury's is awful. <laughs> Add some juice to that. Like, yeah, make that juicy, like make those buttons bounce. If I check my bank balance and it all like jiggles, I'd be like, yeah, I've got no money, but it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I need. That's what I need from life. Yeah, I was going to say, but shout out to our lovely hosts here. I mean, it's hard to walk around this area outside and not be inspired by the visions of the future that Samsung have in particular. Every single one of these was, you know, the glint in the eye of a designer, you know, with an imaginative uh, mm. mindset on how they can solve for washing machines and coffee machines and cycles and all sorts of things I can see on the far side. So, you know, just because it's not games doesn't mean there aren't things to learn. Just because it's not games doesn't mean you can't learn about business and mm. process and tech and just, you know, be an even better candidate once the games industry has put, put the band-aids on and worked out what's, uh, what's going on. And if I might, for Anissa's point about the sort of what, what roles are these agencies playing, these specialists, these external bodies, I'm just going to sort of evangelize for the, the role of specialist businesses, right? These are companies that have forged themselves around a specialism, inherently filled with experts, be they in research or tech or engineering or craft, and they're in extraordinary places to learn. Which isn't to say that working at a game studio isn't, but there is something purist about the fact if you've made a choice to make UI your career trajectory, well, they can't think of anywhere more exciting to hang around with with a bunch of just self-selected awesome UI people making incredible and solving incredible problems. So, that, you know, there's, a, there's absolutely a sort of career turbocharge to be had when working within an agency. Uh, yeah, despite the fact that agencies sometimes get a bit of a bad rap, I'm, I'm, I think that needs to be contested and, and fight for this role of... Yeah, for specialism. sure. And, cause, and from working in like traditional game studios where the UI team would be like one of the smallest teams if, if it was a team, if it wasn't just one person, mm. right? Yeah, it's yeah. Countless times you've been like, I am the UI department, mm -hmm. right? So then when I got the opportunity to join Adam Hawk, and it was like, and we're going to ramp up and there's going to be 15 UI people, I'm like... Mm -hmm. That's a lot of UI mm -hmm. people to have in one team. Yep. And it's great because we nerd out all the time about all the different like, techniques that we're coming up with, all the things, the problems we're solving. 
everyone's on different projects, mm -hmm. like, but then we all kind of come back a house and like talk about how we can help each other, the learnings that we've had on these different problems. So this is the largest UI team I've ever been on. It's fantastic for that. I've oh, heard, gosh. Yeah. Um, I've heard, yeah, I've heard a lot of stories about that. The, sorry, I don't want to plug the book. Well, I can plug the book. Plug plug the book. book. I've got a book coming out. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I interviewed... Um, Oh, Marie Jasmine, who did the UI for Assassin's Creed 2. Okay. And, uh, and, they, and she was saying about uh, Ubisoft, they had this culture of UI UX in the studio, because obviously back then it was like the early days of you know, these new design patterns and that kind of thing. And they literally had like a UI club where they just sort of met up and they, and they traded like design patterns and stuff like that. Because obviously we didn't have like a, a, um, you know, like an archive then at mm -hmm. that point of all these different things. So yep. that's how they did it. So that's really cool. But. There was no, we'll fix it in the UI. There was no yeah. UI peeps yeah. or anything mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah, so we had to. So being part of that bigger team is like, mm -hmm. it's a fun thing. And UI, UX clubs are fun as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember tweeting, like, seeing a tweet about uh, the Persona Five UI team being like what twenty six people, which is the size of an indie team in itself. Mm -hmm. And now you get why the interface in Persona is so good. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so just to bring back the topic onto. Game design. How can you are you at level of game design? So that's like I just realized that's the title of our talk. We should probably talk about game design a little bit. Um, so I want to I want to hear from each of you from your different experiences, you know, of working with game designers and how you know you can make the work better. So I would say like maybe half of you will have to interface with another game designer, and the other half of you will want to know how to talk to a UI person, yeah? So I would say this will be very helpful to know. Uh, for me, I just punched up. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, I would probably, I cannot punch them. Um, so for me, I would say, like, the, uh, the myth is that a UI designer is literally just sitting there making icons. Like, sure, we have to, but to be honest, there's so many icon packs out there that we just take and then, like, change around and do what we want, you know? It's very, icons is, like, 2% of the job, genuinely. Um, I would say a lot of my time is just interfacing with the game designers. And also I think, I don't know about you guys, but like I am that, I am the department in my, mm. in my mm -hmm. company. I'm always the one UI person. So therefore I'm in all of the meetings. I'm in the game design meeting. I'm in the art meeting. I'm in the, you know, I'm meeting with the programmers and I have my own UI meeting with all of these people in it, you know? And there's a point where sometimes we're designing by committee. I'm like literally just sitting there and moving boxes around and the game design being like, no, no, this one, or like the artist being like, no, no, we want this one. And it becomes a thing. So how, how do you guys um, deal with that? Like when you're working with other disciplines, you know, how, how do you find it? How do you think would be the best way to talk to them? Mm -hmm. You know, number one, what are your tips of how to communicate with designers? Okay. You know, I see laughing already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, and also like, what advice would you tell designers? You know, how would you, how would they best communicate with you mm -hmm. as a UI, UX, UR people? You know, so that we can all work in harmony and nobody's throwing knives at each other. I'm saying again, I cannot do that. I wish I could, but I want to um, say a lot of this is the um, Lord of the Rings meme of the uh, I'm not trying to trick you, I'm trying to help you uh, thing. <laughs> when you're talking to designers. Um, I think, in my, because in my career specifically, I started as a designer, and I've also been an artist and a producer, and I've dabbled in code, but I'm not very good at it, kind of thing. So I've, because I've already been all of the roles, when I need to communicate with them, you can establish pretty quickly what type of designer you're, this feels like a David Attenborough thing. When you approach the designer, you can tell by the colour of its feathers which kind of, if it's an introverted or an extroverted designer. Um, but it is all about, like, first of all, like, understand that they're people, right? So build that connection. And people do need to be communicated to in different ways. Some designers, you can go in and be like, you need to explain to me why this is brilliant because I think it's not brilliant. And I think it could be brilliant if we did this. And they will fight for their designs. They will vibe with you. They will be like, no, it's because of this, this, and this. And you have to understand this. And you have really good constructive conversations. Some designers you will go to them with that and they'll be like, oh no, I'm crying now. And it's like, okay, look, when I'm not attacking you, I just feel like there's an approach we can take here to improve it, right? Um, so first of all, like, they're people. Know that they're people. Try and build up a rapport outside of the work relationship first so that you understand how to communicate better. This is easier to do inside a studio where you work with these people on, on the day-to-day. -day. Harder to do if you're doing this client side. 
So when you're working with a client, and obviously the, you, there's always professionalism, right? We're never going in and be like, explain to me why this is good. Like, we wouldn't do that. But you do still need to figure out, okay, how much can I push these guys? How much can I come in with the ideas? How can I test the waters with some of these things? How can I find the thing that they care the least about and try and mm. push that one the most and then see where the boundaries are, are with it? But mostly it's just be talkative, like talk to them, mm -hmm. bring it to the table um, and just be present. Um, it's all about, UX is all about human psychology, right? And mm -hmm. this is all about that. You have to figure them out a little bit first and then you can best approach how to work together on the design. Ed? Okay, this might be controversial. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to figure, figure out ways to word this. <laughs> Don't interact with the designers. <laughs> no, I think uh, I think the the way that it's expected to go is that the game design the game designers will come up with the game. They will pass it to UX designers, and then UX designers will pass it to UI designers, who will make buttons and menus for those things. Um, whereas I see UI as game design, it's, it's all part of the part and parcel of the whole thing. You're so, you're solving the same problems. You can solve a problem in UI or in game design. In level design, you can have a weenie in the background. Weenies are basically like Magic Kingdom, where you have like the, you know, the, it, it kind of guides you towards like a landmark. You can have a waypoint for that in UI, or you can have something in the level itself. That's one problem that can be solved with two different ways, one in UI, one in level design. So there definitely needs to be like an, like an equal conversation between all of those departments. Um, but then, okay, this is the controversial bit now. I think a game should be able to change based on its UI. If you can't solve a problem in UI, or in level design, I think that is where you can talk about the game design and you can be like, maybe we've got too much going on here. Maybe we mm. can simplify things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's my, that's my hottest take mm -hmm. of this evening. It's not some nodding going law, on. I don't I think, think it's that spicy yet. It'll have to work a bit harder. Good. Yeah, no, Good. <laughs> lots of nodding on the panel. Like, yeah, that's makes sense. Yeah, 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 it makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, because I think, um, you know, it's frustrating when, when you're asked to solve a problem and you're mm -hmm. like, okay, the only way, you know, you want me to show this information, all of this information, mm -hmm. but if I show all of this information, there's going to be so much HUD. There's going to be more HUD than game. Sure. You know, and then you get the stupid Elden Ring meme with people moaning about, oh, there's too much on the HUD. Like, I, I know. That's not my fault. <laughs> But I think a lot of this comes down to when you have these conversations with the design team. If you, the whole like waypoint thing is a perfect example of mm -hmm. having the conversation early. If you have the conversation mm -hmm. early with mm -hmm. the team, then you can decide like the best option for the game is that it's built into the environment and we use lighting and color and camera position and sound effects and the character saying, oh, look over there. That's like an early days conversation yep. in the development cycle. Mm. If it gets to everything has been made, but we haven't put any of the UI in and we need it all now, that's a waypoint on a mini map mm -hmm. is how we fix that problem with the yeah. UI. So the later in the development cycle you bring those designers and artists into the conversation, the more it will be stuck on the hood. We have a question. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We need you. We, we, need, we need the roaming we mic. Can we have who's, a big who's, mic? Who's roaming mic? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hey, nice. Uh, it's not, not really a question, but it's just more like an addition to like having that discussion early. And I think that's such a refreshing take because especially with my background being more in like accessibility design, and I think it is very important to have those design discussions early on, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to like design choices focused around accessibility be like oh do we implement like a font that's quite good for people who can't read very well with through dyslexia or something like that or utilizing a lot more iconography as opposed to just simply color like I had quite a lot of jokes with people in my university course where they would show me some of their user interfaces and it was just all red and green and I'm just sat there just going okay it's Nice that it reminds me of Christmas, but you just <laughs> alienated a third of your audience. So I just wanted to say it was lovely to hear that sort of thing. And I just wanted to throw my sense in. It's also good for accessibility as well. Yeah, so. 100%. Yeah. Accessibility is another one of those fields where it's... And it's not like a feasibility point at that point for accessibility. It's a cost. It's very mm -hmm. expensive to put your accessibility features in at the end of the project. Mm -hmm. When you realize you need them, it's mm -hmm. very cheap to put them in when you're thinking about them from the beginning. So we have another... On this one. Yeah, I also, I have to, like, some special phrase for game designers. When they are a bit protective to their idea, to the feature, I have a special phrase. 
I'm here for you. <laughs> I'll bring your feature to the game. Mm -hmm. Let's work together. It's your feature. Yes, it's okay. Let's make it better. Mm. Yeah, or at least work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh. and it's like a baby, you know. <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> it's just sometimes no, it, like it a is. Baby. And we're the fun aunts for the baby. Yeah. Like yeah. we look after it for a little while, then we give it you back with more sweets and <laughs> yeah. clothes and toys. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and when you mm -hmm. try to like, okay. This is not my opinion. This is a player's. And I'll be here for you against them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we won't tell them it's a secret. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's tricky, but it works. <laughs> no, it's a good one. The other popular meme I like to use is the uh, Tron, I fight for the users mm -hmm. meme as well. That's another good one to throw in the conversation. Yeah. We, have one we in had the a hand up there. Why, why does this problem actually emerge? I mean... You've, Ed, you've kind of already suggested it's because uh, UI artists get siloed away from designers. Yeah. We've already heard that it's because accessibility conversations happen, happen at the end, not the start in the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've identified the problem. For people who are maybe more senior in their careers, how do they fix the problem? And if you're coming in at the start, what do you do if you encounter it? Nice for you guys. You're the design side. Yeah. I mean, I've got it's, my own It's take. definitely it's a mindset thing. And it is something that's coming in um, whether people like it or not, this is happening because platforms, PlayStation and Xbox now have non-negotiables for launching on their platforms, right? Especially if you're a first-party studio, their like, TCRs are like, you have to have these features in because they put accessibility quite high in their list of priorities. So if you're a first-party studio for those, those things are already covered. If you're a third-party and you want to get in their good graces, you make sure you have all those things up front, right? The other thing is there's legislation coming in. Uh, America certainly has the, and I'm going to, yeah. yes, thank you. I was going to forget it. So they already have legislation. If your game is a multiplayer game online where you have voice comms, there are things you have to have in there for accessibility. Otherwise they will hit you with a massive fine. Mm -hmm. We're going to have safety by design as well, which leans, borrows a lot for accessible by design as well in that there are already the online safety bill, there's a European version of that, there's an American equivalent, there's a child online safety as well that's happening across Europe, where if you don't have these things, it is like, oh, I can't remember, the, it's like a 10 million pound fine or 10% of your mm -hmm. profits, whichever is greater. Mm -hmm. So you have to start thinking about these things from the beginning. So hopefully mm -hmm. now that, and, for, and it, it's happened with loot boxes and it happened with age ratings before that, because we haven't been proactive as an industry for it, legislation has come in to, to step up and be like, okay, now you have to do these things. Mm. So now we will start to see more of this mind shift from the design teams to be like, okay, maybe we need to get those experts in now because if we don't, we're going to get halfway through production and realize we have to scrap a load of stuff and we have to reevaluate all this stuff. Mm. It's a mindset change. It's the thing that I think will happen a lot faster now. I think the, there will be certainly more conversations more early. 10 years ago in the industry, we didn't even have accessibility features, right? Mm. Now it's a whole division in bigger companies. Sure. So it is something that's moving forward. It's just, we're not there yet. So we're, we're going to get there. Mm. But we, as, a, as our discipline, be aware that if we can get in the room, if we can get in those conversations earlier, we make everybody's life a lot easier further down the line. But it's an excellent point. It really is. I think it has to do with making friends with the game designers, you know, um, having someone champion UI, you know, because one of the things about these kind of meetings is that they always want to have less people, you know, the fewer headcount, the better. And I think in general, we could use less meetings for sure, 100%. But how do you know that we're in the important ones, you know, and not being left out? So that's kind of where they'll find balances. But I would say, like, for me personally, um, I have been very lucky to have game directors who insist that I am in these meetings. It's like, mm -hmm. no, we need Anissa here, or we need a UI person here, or at least a UI representative of sorts. Um, and I think, again, in recent years, in recent memory, that's get, becoming more common where people can see the value of UX and UI. Not, you know, we're just not like icon monkeys. Um, but yeah, it's slowly happening there. And I think, again, this comes back to like having a really good relationship with your game directors, your game designers, you know, approach them very slowly before they get skittish. Uh, however, I am interested, um, Seb, how, how has it been communicating? Like you do player research, I do. you know, with researching, how do you communicate your research back to designers in a way that doesn't like, how do you find it? Do you think it it's offends them sometimes or do you yeah. think they get excited to see where their holes are? How is yeah, it so like? My sense is my job is a little easier than, than you folks because 
by definition, research is somehow creatively impartial. The idea is that as a research division or research individual or research agency, my job is to test, put to the test, the things that the creators have imagined. So all of the assets you're producing, you've talked about very many, they all have, they're just a bundle of guesses, right? Hypotheses about what the player will do, what the player will think, how the player will feel, when they interact with this thing. That thing could be a washing machine, but it's probably in this context, it's a video game, right? But this is applicable to all um, tech design too. Uh, and, pu and put it to the test, right? So that's my job. I'm going to help you work out whether the thing you've made is doing the thing you want. When you close your eyes and you imagine a player playing this thing and loving it, you've got all of these wicked things that the players are doing, these imaginative, creative things. But what happens if you put a real human into this thing you've made? Do they actually do that? Because if they don't, then something about the product has to change. Because otherwise, mm. it's just simply not going to manifest in the, the eventual real players. And so as a sort of somewhat... Cre I, I, don't, I don't inherently don't have a creative vision to impart on the game, although don't mistake that as me saying I don't know how to do good design, or that I'm able, not able to support the solutioning in the UX space, um, but I'm inherently creatively somewhat impartial in all senses. So it's a lot easier for me to talk to designers and feel less like I'm either stepping on their toes. I am somewhat there to mark their homework, I guess, which could be, you know, a difficult relationship. But broadly speaking, there's a sort of a more of a, a amicable relationship between the two. As for communicating it back to, uh, to design, well, it mostly looks like videos of players not doing the thing you expected. So here's 10 minutes of someone trying to make a, craft a sword or defeat that boss and just you know, smashing their face against this thing that you hoped they would just immediately do or having a terrible time doing it when you imagined them having a, uh, quite the opposite experience. And that's extraordinarily compelling. It's very tough to look mm -hmm. at minutes and minutes of players doing something you imagined they would spend 10 seconds doing and saying, ah, yeah, that design's great, let's ship it. Uh, so a, little, a different relationship with design as a discipline and with designers, uh, but nonetheless, I said, you know, not without its complexities and political influence inside the studio. And if you want to stay friends with the design team, don't say I told you so when the no. player research no. comes back supporting no, everything. No, never, <laughs> never goes that way. Well. Uh, and it's hard, it is hard. Have a jar on your desk that you put a little coin in yeah. and then just... Keep that but, to one side. But there is something of the voice of UX design that has to say, we could have told you that, right? There is something inherent to the patterns we have and the knowledge we have of human psychology and the design of everyday things. But let's just say, oh, yeah, we, players would predictably have done that. If you don't show them the thing, if it doesn't flash, if you never say the word, they're not going to remember it, recall it, understand it, use it, be able to interact with it. If you're providing them with this fantastic machine that they've never seen, they're not going to be able to interact with and use it. And so there, there must be something we can say, mm. I could have told you so. Otherwise, UX doesn't sort of have any body of knowledge that's valuable to them. Does that make sense? Uh, so, yeah, no, I told you so's, but we can find a better way to, 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 uh, to wrap them to say, can we please be involved earlier so we can stop making mis preventable design mistakes? I, I did something recently on the lines of like, oh, it would have been really nice to get this like, early on. Mm -hmm. you know, it would have been really lovely. You know, how about you try and give me a problem next time rather than a solution mm -hmm. and I'll try and, I'll try and fix it. Just don't worry about it, I'll fix it for you. Don't. <laughs> Just looking for fights, aren't you, Ed? <laughs> Somebody fight me. Um, yeah, I, I kind of have, uh, in, in one of my recent projects, it was an inter interesting thing where, um, because I was the only UX person in the room, uh, and we were discussing, you know, some, some game design element of it, and they all were just like, well, you know, we think Anissa should decide this. And I'm like, Ooh, please do not put this on me. You know, I, I do not want to make the calls on this, because I don't know about you, but like, I always feel... I never know the answer, you know, because I just cannot predict mm -hmm. what the uh, user is going to do. Mm -hmm. And most of all, especially especially if you're so early in prototyping, in the prototyping phase, when it's not even like full production yet, you're still finding out, you know, what if we did this? What if we did that? Mm -hmm. And then it's mm -hmm. kind of like the game design itself is in flux. And I'm just like, dude, I don't. I was gonna start. Like, I don't a thing know, <laughs> like what you're gonna do here. You know, like I don't know what what we want the players to feel here. I don't know, like is this the final design? You know, yeah. so when they ask me to be like, yeah, yeah, you decide here. How do you actually be? I'm like, you don't even know what the game design is like yet. Yeah. You just said a very key thing though, which was I don't know what you want the player to feel here, mm. and that sometimes mm. the design team don't know what they want the player to feel, and it's figuring that out early doors. 
helps answer so many of your questions from the UX point of view as well, sure. because it's like, I want them to be confused by this, but figure it out and feel smart at the end of it. Sure. Okay, mm. cool. That is a set of like conditions that we yeah. can work with. Or I want them to be confused by it and feel stupid when they solve it. Yeah. That's a different ask yeah. altogether. And we can also work towards that. But this is where testing early, testing often, failing fast is so important to game design because it just, it, again, it's one of those things that if you don't do it early, it costs you so much money to do it late. So do it early when it's cheap. Um, test as frequently as possible. A, B, test stuff all the time. If you've got two conflicting ideas and you're like, I don't know which one of these is going to resonate better with the players, test both. Like yep. You just get loads of usable data at the yep. end of it and that's super useful to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um I had something to say in my head, but I completely forgot. <laughs> I was going to compliment you. Go on. Can't think of the next thing. The, the, again, thinking about what does UX contribute to the game design space? A UX superpower, for sure, is articulating those hypotheses. You said, like, I'm not going to make the decision, but I know we're going to make a guess, and I'm going to mm -hmm. write that guess down, and it's going to hit the playtest lab. And, but UX design has a particular superpower in thinking like that. Mm -hmm. Thinking like, these are, guess these are the guesses, there are 10 guesses mm -hmm. that this prototype is designed to evaluate, mm -hmm. and then that's just a researcher's dream. Because guess mm -hmm. what, that's just straight to a test plan, straight to the lab, and we can bring back and say, pass or fail, and go around again and see mm -hmm. how we do it. Um, actually, I just remember what I was going to say. Thank you. Um, so one of the things about communication in general is that not just the game designers, but sometimes if you, if you talk to more practical people, um, programmers, um, I find that we tend to have to defend our designs like uh, a viva, you know, almost, where they're like, oh, but why though? Especially if your UI is very elaborate, you know, sometimes you have mm. um, elements that are doubling up on this certain, certain information and I'll for me, I'm always saying like, yes, I know we have this to say this information and this, but it's also enforcing it because you players might miss the, the cues of this, which might be just colors. So players might not make you know the connection of the colors. So we have numbers to show it. Sometimes you don't want the numbers. You have like icons, you know, which of these elements are you showing and how many of them at the same time? And I actually had a very recent conversation about um, health bars where you know we have a number to show the health bar and then we have a bar and I'm just like and they're like do we need both like surely just the number is enough because it doesn't matter how long the bar is that's what the programmer is like again um, I'm putting a voice in this, to this programmer in fact it was a very neutral conversation he was very much like but why though you know in a very like but why and you, it's kind of like a five year old going like but why and just like because I said so no mm -hmm. um, at this point this is where you kind of want to talk about like we want the players to feel this way yeah. so. In the case of the bar, you know, if we only had a number, I'm like, sure, that communicates the number of, you know, how high your health is. But for me, having a bar is a visual representation of just how high your health is. So the longer the bar, you know, the stronger you are, you know, it's a, it's a dead contest. But, oh, God, I forgot this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. I think pro kind of programmers are a, a fun uh, case for the communication pipeline, because if you have a dedicated UI programmer, you then... You're so lucky. That's so good because yeah. they are programmers. My experience, this is just anecdotal, my experience programmers, they like to come up with elegant solutions to problems and they like to like solve it once. And then UI comes along and is like, every single one of these is a bespoke problem that needs its own bespoke solution. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to break all of them when we do the tutorial and you need to recode it all for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the tutorial incidentally is going to be seen one time by the player and it will take you twice as long to code than any of the other buttons that we've done in the menu. Mm -hmm. And like UI coders, UI programmers, they're like, that's their bread and butter. They love it. They live for it. They get to do those challenges over and over again. Mm -hmm. If it's not a dedicated UI coder, they're like, but why though? <laughs> And it's that yeah. whole thing of like, I'm sorry, but it's just, it's for the onboarding of the game. That's why we have to do it. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but you do have to be able to, again, it's that piece of find out how to communicate with them on a level that you guys can get like mutual appreciation for each other's arts and then mm -hmm. work with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. back, to um, this, so back to this idea of UX being a sort of imp human psychology being essential to the purpose. If you can articulate the purpose of a visual HUD as being the player doesn't have to flick their eyes up to look at it. They can just read it, look at it in their peripheral vision instead of having to flick their eyes up to read the number and you know, internalize it. That's a much more valid, rational understand, a reason to give the, of it being hard rather than a number than I like bars or I like numbers. Right? So again, with this UX mindset of articulating design decisions by the impact on the player experience, be that avoiding a negative or promoting a positive, uh, and, and again, that, that power of being able to articulate that as a pillar of the product through the friction that's intended. 
uh, regardless of the genre or audience, whether it's a tough or, or an easy. Oh, game. I like that. That's a really good pull. I think like. I think the hardest uh, sort of decisions to put across to like anyone really is programmers or you know games designers aren't sort of UX kind of focused. I guess um, it's just the kind of any anything that kind of involves less is more. Mm. It's like a really difficult thing to put across because I because I you know I like using contrast to highlight things sure. by reducing everything around it. You can make something yes. push you know, um, but a lot of people will be like. Yeah, because this is this is really, you know, this is uh, relying on the fact that someone will basically just walk aimlessly into something or click mm. something because it's the only thing that stands out. Yeah. But a lot of people can't see that. A lot of people who don't design uh, for a living. So, you know, and, you know, programmers or whatever. So, sure, sure. you know, a lot of people will be like, no, 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 give them all the options and let them decide. Or put an arrow there yeah. and point at the thing you want them to click, you know. And it's like there are, there are much smarter ways of doing that. And, yeah, it's one of those principles that people just don't know about. No, I quite yeah. agree. You know, I think for sure. It's a perennial problem inside game development that, uh, that you get, gets more complicated over time. Mm -hmm. right, the, the more time you spend thinking about the game, the more features it seems to need, the game just bloats in complexity. Right? And it takes a fresh player going through the process, going through the game, mm. for, for sometimes to sort of be the, the contrast, right? the, the other, pushing the thumb on the other side mm. of the scale that says, oh yeah, actually maybe this has reached too much complexity or we need to stretch that complexity out. So it's one of these perennial game development problems that you have to contest actively mm. with playtesting and user yep. research and putting yep. people in front of it. Test early, test often, which yep. I firmly agree with. Um, yeah, there are very many out of these perennial problems. I'm not sure if any others spring to mind, but... Hey, if I had a pound for every time a game started with there'll be no or minimal UI mm -hmm. and then ends with the most arcadey damage numbers popping all over the place <laughs> UI you've ever seen in your life, I'd have at least five pounds. Yeah. But it's, it was one of those things where games do get more complicated as they go. And that's yeah. one of the fun things about working in games, I think, is it's a, a journey, it's an evolution. You develop with it as you go. But just a quick one on like the... the communicating the ideas and I can't remember who did it there's a great GDC vault talk about I think it's the four types of designer mm. I wish I could remember the name of the guy who did it it was very insightful because when you've watched that and you realize okay there are if you're working with a design team and one of them happens to be like the, the empath uh, the one who sees things from the player's point of view mm. you've lucked out that's golden they will understand everything that you want from a UX point of view because that's how they see the game as well they see it from that player's perspective mm. but there will also always be the mechanic and that is the person that sees everything as the numbers and graphs and the charts mm. behind the scenes and all of like all of the tables that they're putting together all of the systems that they're putting in it if that's your designer on the project, you're going to have to work a lot harder on communicating things from the player's point of view and be like, yeah. I know that the system that you've made is beautiful and all those numbers are gorgeous, but I'm telling you the player already cares about that one. Mm. And that's the one that we should focus on. And then let's put all these other ones in a menu somewhere else for them to find later when they're, when they're interested. But there's, yeah, if you can, that's a great talk to find. Make a note to Google that. I wish I could remember who did it. Um, <laughs> But being able to identify what kind of designer you're working with, what kind of code you're working with, mm -hmm. what kind of art direction you're working with. Once you've figured that out, then you know instantly. It's like, okay, I need to attack this one in this way because that's where I'm going to get the results that's going to benefit the end product or get us to that testing quicker, get us to, to figuring these things out faster. That's great mm -hmm. advice. Um, so, Ed... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, I want to give some time today to kind of talk about your amazing work with game data, game UI database. I could never say it. <laughs> game UI database 2.0, which has oh, yeah. only recently released. Yeah, yes. how long ago was it released? Uh, about two months now. Two about months two months now. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, would you like to talk a bit more about you know how game UI yeah. database kind of came about and you yeah, know sure. how has it kind of improve the lives of many many UI and game designers out there, including mine. Oh, uh, well, yeah, so... Um, Sit up, like. It's something... Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's something I built uh, during the pandemic. So uh, when I was in freelance, I took on a lot of, a lot of jobs for not much money because I was a terrible businessman at that mm -hmm. point. So I had loads and loads of jobs. And, um, and as I say, like this is before, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure like when Double Eleven approached me, they're just like, oh, you've just got loads of stuff in, in your portfolio. Great kind of thing. But it was just very varied because I've worked on so much stuff. Um, but because I've worked on so much stuff, I needed references for halftone and trouble patterns and art deco to so sound familiar. For anyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so this is why I started uh, my own like Rep um, repository, is that word? Repository. Repository, yeah. Uh, like, sort of just for, for myself, really, to collect stuff. 
Um, so there was like a, like I had a, a version for me about eight months before I released it and I was still using it. And, um, there's that term dog fooding, isn't there? Like we're using, using the stuff that you build for yourself kind of thing. And, um, yeah, essentially through that I improved it and I thought, okay, I've got to release it at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I have a friend, husband, where's husband? There he is, hello. <laughs> so yeah, my good friend husband. He uh, he really encouraged me to keep up, keep on with it because you know I was like, well, people like this, well, people love it, and and husband was like, you got to do this. People will love it. People will love it. So I went I went on with it, and yeah, then uh, basically launched it uh, December fifth, I think, two thousand, mm. and it. Pfft, you know, I'd never, I'd never done anything that was newsworthy before in my life, let alone, you know, and it went, it went viral on Twitter. I wasn't using Twitter at the point, but I thought I'd better use Twitter now, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was just insane. I won uh, one award, like a couple of awards uh, the year after. Guinness World Record. That, yeah, I won a Guinness, Guinness World, World Record. Guinness World Record, yeah. We, I won that two years ago. I only found that out like a month ago. <laughs> Because, because I was looking for something about the database, so I Googled it randomly, and the Guinness World Record came up, and I was just like, is this real? Like, is someone having me on? And I contacted them, like, yeah, you won a record, congratulations. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've got a nice, a nice frame now for my new house. Oh, nice. Very might nice. Might put it, it above the toilet. Like I was going to say, put it in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be done. Has uh, it come in handy for either of your work? Oh, unquestionably, yeah. Yeah, every, every day. <laughs> like, you... You were right. The people will love it. Yes, they, they did love it. You built it, <laughs> and they love it. So it's, it, it still baffles me every day. Like I see it from from sort of like a very close up point of view every day working on it. You know, like my boyfriend, he makes a joke constantly. To, I wish he wouldn't, but he makes. I'm going to say it out loud. That's I mean. But he makes a joke like, you know, I have to deal with him sitting in his pants until two a.m. tagging <laughs> things on that bloody database. <laughs> you know. And uh, it's quite a good impression there. <laughs> and uh, like, so yeah, like that's from the, p the point of my point of view, yeah. it's like this. And then I put something out and I still, you know, 2.0, I never expected it to do well. I was, you know, just terrified. And, and then people came up and, and they loved it. And they loved the, all the changes and all the improvements. And I literally burst into tears, ran down to Matt downstairs and said, they like it, they really like it. <laughs> they so, love me. <laughs> But it's like, but it, but that was full of really tough UX problems to solve, yeah. you know, because that you know because mm -hmm. it hadn't been done before. This sort of split between the sort of styled stuff and the UX stuff, and then video came into it. So it's like, what do I do with that? Do I split that from from images? You know, in the end, I I, I combined them and I had a filter for, you know, prioritizing uh, videos. So like all of these different you know challenges, and I have like pages and pages of notes uh, that I've just scribbles and, and things where I've been trying to figure this all out. Um, and then, of course, there's the actual taking the, the screenshots and the videos, and that's, you know, and I'll tell you, like, that has kind of ruined games, from, well, it mm. did for a bit, because, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'll be like, oh, a brand new game, yes, Mary Wonder, and then I'll be like, ah, oh, there's a tutorial, I should probably take screenshots, this. no, <laughs> you're going to enjoy the game, um, and it's really funny, because, again, Matt, he, he got uh, Baldur's Gate 3, uh, well, last year, wasn't it, last year? And you would. Let <laughs> like him play the game. Oh my god! Yeah. So you're ruining video games for everybody, yeah. not just yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Baldur's Gate Three is not. If you want to, if you <laughs> just talk to him. Um, okay. But, so yeah. yeah, thank you so much for um, the amazing existence of Game mm -hmm. UI Database 2.0. Um, I want to say, like, it's it's. I think in from a historian archivist point of view as well. I think you know we want to preserve video games in in ways oh, that yeah, yeah. you know that is useful for us to look back. You know the, the progress that we've made, especially in UI, UX, and game design as well. You know because we build, we are we are standing on the shoulders of giants before us. You know all of these video games, philo um, philosophies and uh, mm. concepts and patterns, libraries of them, you know, yeah. nothing we do is new, I don't think. We're just rehashing things people have already found out. In fact, you know, we're going to have generations of newer designers in the future. You know, mm. the first step is to see what we've done, you know, and what people have done before us. So thank you so much for doing I, all I get, that hard work. I get work. so stressed by games that are like about to die. 
and and the UI is about to like fade into nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and Capture like, them before they vanish forever. You yeah. know, like the internet is surprisingly not forever. You know. And and like mobile games, especially, they just disappear. They don't even warn yeah. you. They just mm. vanish. And uh, and it's really interesting as well because I'm I'm like fascinated by cross response. Uh, I call it uh, what is it? Controller responsive UI. That's what I call it. Mm -hmm. Where it's like UI that can be used flawlessly between mouse and gamepad and touch. Um, and like now with Apple, you know, venturing in crap. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on, carry on. Another, carry on. another so company. No one noticed, no one noticed. No, 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 Samsung no, no, no. Some sort of uh, venturing the, into... The, 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 the Google store. <laughs> the the some, some store. Uh, uh, with, with some people venturing into mo mobile gaming and turning their devices into uh, games consoles. Uh, you know, we're seeing this really interesting thing here where, where uh, mobile games are actually compatible with gamepad as well. And, uh, and you're getting this cross-compatibility between the two. And that's, like, fascinating for me because it's like... You know, these, these don't exist very much. Like, these are very quite, you know, quite rare mm -hmm. design patterns mm -hmm. here. So I go after them, like, oh, it's a rare one, quick, get it, kind of thing, before it dies. Um, yeah, so. We're very thankful for your hard work, Ed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay, thank you so much. And in the interest of time, uh, we are wrap about to wrap up. However, do we still have time for a bit of QA? I think we've got time for like three questions. Right. Like really like maybe good. five, 10 minutes. Okay, we have. One has been there, and then we got one in the um, we can fix it in UI T-shirt, which I also have. Um, and who wants to do a third? And you on the far corner, okay? Unless I missed anyone here, okay? You lost you, you you lost your chance, okay? <laughs> All right, husband, go. Hi, thank you very much for doing that. This panel is great. Um, I'm going to be a little bit greedy with my question. As one of those programmer slash designers slash person in the lead role that Ed has a uh, contempt for, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, uh, I, would I would actually love one thing that you all wish designers slash programmers or even people in lead would take into consideration when it comes to either UX or UI design, because to some extent the tone of it, and understandably so, is just like programmer design being a little bit too precious. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just like, yeah, what do you wish the other side of the fence would take into consideration when it came to that stuff? Thank you. You're not making the game for yourself. Mm. That's the number one thing. Like, I mean, maybe you are. If you are a solo dev and you're making this game for yourself and you just want to put it out into the world to be like, I made that, look at me, I'm great. Fantastic. And those things do exist. But for most people, they're making the game for other people to play. You're making it for other people to play. So you are inherently too close to your game design. Mm -hmm. That's why you need to work with us and trust us when we tell you that you're too close to your game design. And we're, again, we're not trying to trick you. We're trying to help you. We're trying to make it as playable, as broad, reach as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And, and again, the less is more principle, like that's really important. Like, you know, people who make games who don't really understand sort of UX stuff, um, you know, they will overload it with everything because they're trying to get the player to notice something. When actually the player notices something because it's the only thing on the screen in most cases. So, you know, this is a really difficult thing. As I said before, it's a really difficult thing to teach to people. Probably the most difficult part, you know, of like the layout and, and all that kind of stuff is, you know, because it really is like less is more and using contrast to pull things back, you know, so the player, mm. yeah. You can achieve so much with contrast. Mm, yeah, I quite agree. Mm. I think it's, for me, sort of captured by both of you, this idea that everything you make is just a hypothesis, and it's just a kind of gamble, an amalgam of your best guesses about how, what the player will think and do and love, and just, you just have to reserve a little of yourself to be ready to hear that they don't do the thing that you want, or understand the thing that you want, or love the thing that you've made. And so let's just leave that gear spinning in the back of your head so that if it does turn out, when you put it in front of real players, that... They don't do any of those things, that we've got uh, the energy and the time and the motivation uh, and the money to make the changes that are necessary to, like, to manifest this thing that you have uh, behind your eyes. Uh, if I could have my answer is that I, I hope that every discipline realizes just how iterative UI is. Mm. Um, it is one of, one of the few things that will be continuously changing up until the very, very last minute, literally the final week before, you know, like, you know, code lock, you will still be changing the UI. So therefore, like, um, 
if early on you're kind of complaining, why do you have to do this all over again? Like, well, this is the rest of your life, so fucking deal with it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can I try? <laughs> um, you anyway. so well, Anissa. You're doing so well. Uh, um, let's go to the second gentleman over there. So as uh, another, like, programmer, um, who has to deal with kind of all of you guys with pretty often. Slot. With us. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. For, I mean, I've been doing this for 16, 17 years. So it's, it's, I've been there, done that. And a lot of times, how do you guys feel about having sort of early touch points with your programmers and implementation people, if the technical designer may be involved as well, depending on your team size, um, of trying to, like, I guess, get kind of early feedback of, like, is this feasible? Is this not feasible? And and kind of like, is that a thing you guys do? Or if or if you don't, can I please ask you do that all the time? Sure. Because good God, it would make everybody's life a little bit easier. Yeah, this is an easy one for us since I've pr pretty much put in front of players nearly every type of asset that you can crystallize, right? Every discipline's asset that they think, oh, I've, I've made an early version of a thing. I've put that in front of players in some way. It absolutely can be done. That's a script. That's previous video. That's like uh, footage captured straight from a performance capture stage. That is uh, like mo found art, mood boards, gray box prototypes, blockouts, any, anything that you bring together to say, this is a, a decent shot of what I think the game is going to be, can be put in, put in front of players in a meaningful way to garner feedback that's, that's useful for you. And the sooner you do that, the better. Uh, so yeah, it, you really can play test pretty much anything. And I strongly encourage you to do so. This is one of the reasons why for Atom Hog Advance, we always try and work um, embedded on a team. We always try and put our artists or designers embedded and working on, like, on a retainer model with our clients so that they can have these conversations with the designers and the coders and the artists. Um, I'm very much a believer in like any design that you're putting together. When you're, when you're mocking something up or prototyping something, you come up with something that's like, oh, this is really cool, this would be cool. Can they build this? My, that's always my first question is like, can we build this? Is it feasible? I don't mm. want to pitch to the directors this really flashy, really beautiful motion graphic scene that I've built in After Effects. And then the coders look at it and go, well, that's brilliant, but we'll never be able to make it. Thanks for that. Like, that's not, you're not going to get the best results out of your team if you do that. So my first port of call, and this is why I install on my team as well, is always take it to the people who are implementing it. First, take it to the designers, make sure it meets their expectations and that it's in the realm of feasibility. And sometimes if you do it early enough, you can inspire them to be like, I can't do it yet. Let me have a look, let me work on it. And then you get to that point and then you pitch it to the, the directors, the people who are signing off on it to give you that green light to move forward. And that way you just avoid disappointment all around. So I, and again, like I've been in the other shoes. So I know what it's like when it happens to you, when it, something happens and you're like, well, there's no way I can do that. That's brilliant. That's, that's me for the next six months banging my head against that. Don't want to put other people in that position. So I'm very much like, check with the people building it. If it's not you, check with those people and make sure that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. I have a really funny story where I, where I learned that lesson the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was at Double Eleven, it was my first studio, uh, first proper like, you know, big studio role, um, and especially as a senior. So I was drunk with power for the first six months in that role. Uh, and like, I essentially was given like artists and people, and I was like, right, okay, cool. First game to go in a box, to go in a shop, let's go, kind of thing. So I was like, right, let's have a title screen where it pans around this environment, and we have these menus that pop out diegetically and all this kind of stuff. And I was in my own little world with my team. They were concepting all this stuff out and all that kind of... And then about... A month later, I sort of give it to them, and, and they're like, what? what? I asked you to do a tile screen. <laughs> like a menu, just a menu kind of thing. And I was like, yeah, but we could have this, in, this prison environment. All that kind of, yeah, so, yeah, I learned, I learned the hard way. That, that, but, um, yeah, like some studios do tend to kind of like silo these, these teams off, and, yeah, that was one of the, yeah. Hopefully they don't do that after that. No? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very fine, like, again, so it's a balancing act in a way that, um, you know, for me, I work in a smaller team, again, sole UI person. Um, one of the things, uh, one of our previous teams uh, had a really 
a generous art director who kind of let me again have these crazy ideas. They're, again, they were like, we just want a menu, dude. And I'm just like, what if we did this? What if we did that? They kind of allowed me to have that moment of like, just get it out of her system. Like, yeah, da da da. And then within like the, the first week of like meeting the other coders and stuff, they've hammered it down to me. I was like, yeah, we can't do that. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm sorry, never again. <laughs> um, but essentially, I would say like moving forward from that, I want to say the first iteration of your design when you have like your brief, what you want to do, like it's, it's always good to talk with the designers, you know, kind of like, okay, what are the intentions of this? You know, let's, let's go as creative as it is. You know, it's easier to go big and then kind of wind that down a little bit rather than like mm. boxing yourself in this small idea and then trying to reach out. And then you go, you know, you and your designers are like, okay, would it be cool to have this and have this and have this? And then the next step before you, you know, the next step is to have the programmers and you say, this is what we're thinking. Is it feasible in this way? It's a conversation where the programmers can be like, yes, no, that's too much. Or like, what are you trying to do here? Like, is there a more cheaper way of doing this? You know, maybe instead of a model, it could be an image, stuff like that. Or sometimes I'm just like, I'm again, with technology, it evolves so quick, especially now that like, I don't know about you, but like I have to learn, you know, Unity, Unreal, Godot right now. So all of these are slightly different and your limitations are different as well. And, you know, your access to certain resources is different. So do you have a VFX artist with you or is it something that you can buy from like an asset pack or something? So all of these, like as the designer, you might not know, your programmer might have an idea. But they're like, oh, I've done this before. Like, I have, like, we already bought the asset pack for that or what have you. So, yes. And then after that, you can go a bit more deeper. So, yeah, I would say, like, conversations with programmers is early, but not, not the first. The first would be your designers. The second is the programmers. And then that, was, that is the crucial conversation where you have everybody's in, you know, including the game director. And they're just like, okay, cool. You know, let's go with it before you start working on it. And also, yeah, having the programmers... Thumbs up means less wah, 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 <laughs> at the end of the line. But yeah, I like programmers. They're great, mostly. <laughs> um, we have our, sorry, we have one, do we? Is that the third and final question? That is not, not a question, just like an addition. We had a question at the front, though. So we'll have the addition comment, and then we'll have the question. Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, also, you have to know about level of your team. Mm. I've asked my uh, new colleagues about, let's make some uni um, UI shaders. I know we, we can do it fast. We can save a lot of budget. And then I, I, I just forgot. I worked with the re really senior principals before. And then my new team, I just turned back and saw few juniors, babies, developers. Babies. With, with fear in their eyes. Yes. Yeah. They shaders. just like, why? <laughs> They're like, she's... And she's crazy. What? What? What she wants? What? <laughs> and I forgot about it. I forgot about different levels. Yeah. And I have to think about: do, can do? Can we do this or not? Mm -hmm. Because it's also it's like some limitations, and I have to be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Right, this is the last question. Final just, question. Just no pressure. But every minute we answer is a minute less that we network. Oh, okay, oh. yes. Prompt answers, I'm sorry. Cool. Your answer to this question might be no anyway, so maybe we'll be quick. <laughs> um, but I think a lot about Game Pass and PlayStation Plus Extra and even streaming to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, has it changed the way that you design games or the way that you conduct research mm -hmm. or UI, that kind of thing, you've noticed? Yes. Mm hmm <laughs> okay, and that wraps it up. <laughs> no, actually, um, streaming's an interesting one because it raises a bunch of fun things that you have to consider when you're like making a game, especially if it's like a massive multiplayer online game with streaming, and it's like, okay, but how can we communicate this stuff when we have to take the players' names out of the equation? Because then you're not going to have that information mm -hmm. like when we're streaming it or what have you, and how we do all the different layers for the different platforms. So it, it, it has made it harder. It's made it more complicated. It's put more things for you to consider. It's made those checklists that you have to go through when you are going through like certification and when you're trying to get the game released you know, that's, that's a whole department now for mm -hmm. studios. That is a whole thing that you can outsource and is people just checking that you're hitting all the tick boxes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the 
the way that we play games now, it's, it's so different and all the different avenues to getting them. And actually going back to the point of like putting your UI in front of the coders before you put it in front of the directors, also remember what platforms you're launching it on so that you know, mm. like I've designed this amazing UI with all of these different overlay states. It's on mobile devices. You don't need that. Pants, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are a bunch of things that have changed, and you know, as a UX designer, we have to think about. Nice. I'm gonna, I th there's two things for me, I think, on, on this. Uh, although I say less streaming and more esports itself. Esports is like a genre of games. We suddenly have to consider the spectator experience. Like, so not the player experience. There's only ten of them, well, let's say, playing the game, but the ten thousand or more people that are watching this game and have to follow it and have to understand it and work out what's going on in the most extreme version of that game being played, particularly in some you know, more chaotic MOBAs that can be like a fireworks show. So there's suddenly a new audience of this game, which is someone that's not playing but observing. What does it mean to design an experience for them? First layer. And then secondly, on streaming in particular, because that was your question, how do we incorporate the feedback from streamers who aren't players but are consumers and are inherently influential on... The, on players and their purchasing decisions. So as a pl player research now has to consider these st perhaps streamers or content creators as a sort of subset of the audience uh, at, with outsourced power on the success of the game. Very interesting research questions. Um, there can also be an, an element of uh, sort of, we need to get players in the game quickly because there's so much here yeah. they can play. Yeah. You know, so sometimes onboarding, it can sometimes, that can come up in the conversation about onboarding, like, you know, they need to be hooked quickly, mm. kind of thing. So, but I think that's just general about games and yeah. all over, really. But, but, you know, I think if you pay £50 for a game, you're more likely to stick with that thing, as opposed to if you download something on Game Pass mm, and play it, and then you'd be like, ah, you know, first five minutes, I'm, I'm bored, I'm going to play something mm. else, you know, kind of yeah, thing. Absolutely. Think so about that's that. another yeah, Steam that refund see. window, right? That's yeah, the, yeah, yeah, that's yeah the, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. period we've got to try and... It's mm -hmm. like, right. if you look at music, uh, music is another interesting one for streaming because of licensed music and it demonetizing channels. Mm. But the um, Spotify generation of music has changed. If you look at the, the I think it was The Guardian did an article of this about the length of a, a song's intro, mm. because people will skip a song after like 10 seconds if they haven't had lyrics yet. Mm. So you don't get songs with epic intros anymore like you used to in the 80s or the 70s or whatever. Mm. Games are doing the same sort of thing where it's like, if I don't hook the player in the first 10 minutes of playing, then they're just going to not play the rest of it. And then I'm not going to get my monetization from that platform, especially for other mobile device stores, for example. <laughs> so you want to be able to hook people quickly and keep them in the game for longer because then as the game you know, makers, that's how, we, that's how we generate the revenue from it. Yeah. yeah. We've been ever so careful over here, guys. Mm. <laughs> Amazing work, good, everybody. Good. Yeah, okay, so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to round out today's talk. Um, it, time flew by so quick. I oh, know, honestly, we can shit on designers all day long. Sorry. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> As the final, like final sign off, um, yep. I'm going to ask the same question to all of you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what advice would you give yourself, your younger self, with all of the knowledge now you have as a very prominent senior person in the field of UI UX? What would you tell your younger self, Ed? Make the game UI database. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it earlier. Ship <laughs> it. Uh, I act, well, actually, make well references. Just that how important they are. Analyze references. Look really close at that. I think I resisted it for so long because um, I, I, you know, I think I felt like it was cheating or, or something. I don't know why. Yeah, but like, you know, when I was making UI for the first time way back, I absolutely hated it. Mm. Um, you know, I had, I had, I did have a folder of references, but I didn't know exactly what I was looking at. And I think if I ever, you know, if I bothered to look at the building blocks of those references, I would have understood how to make UI properly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was only until someone gave me that piece of advice where I was like, oh, you know, you know kind of thing. So, because I, I think I was looking for a reference like exactly what I was looking for so I could copy it mm -hmm. and just change the color or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, probably that references. Oh, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I would tell my, myself when I was playing the original Wipeout game that the reason why I love that game is because of the UI and it's not just a phase. <laughs> it's, it's not going to go away. You're going to come back to this in a, in a hard way. You're going to come back to this. Um, but actually, I would have told my younger self to make, be in more different game roles up to where I got to and probably stick with coding, actually figure out mm -hmm. how to program because it's such a, a useful tool to have for UI, UX. Being a technical UX designer or being a UI designer who can do, even if it's rudimentary in implementation, it just 
makes your decision, it gets you to fail faster, quicker, because mm -hmm. you've, you've circumvented a load of issues because you know what the end part looks like. So just mm -hmm. actually learn C++. Make, just do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's something I mentioned right at the beginning. I think I'll go back to it. This idea that a good, strong component of the UX discipline, whichever part of it you work in, is the business of game development and the internal politics and decision-making and process of studios. So we can get really absorbed in the craft in one way or another, be that coding or art or what have you. But that's, and that's fantastic, and you can be a great individual contributor and artisan. But to effectively fully you know, reach the edges of the role of UX, you have to be a team player. And that means learning the business of game development, learning how to speak to management about money, about monetization, and learn how all the different, port, how all the different parts of game development work in order to help it make it work better by asking even as simple questions as, should it be a number or a PUD, or mm. should there be a button there at all, or why are we making this more complex? So not ignoring the business component and the managerial operational component of the UX skill set, uh, and focus on that right from your early career. Amazing, thank you so much. I wish we had more time, because you know, the business side of your UX is something that is also very interesting. You know, mm. How do you serve? Um, UX to serve business and not just the players. These two are very different things. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stop myself here because we will be talking about this for too long. Um, however, how can we all find you online, um, Ed? Uh, uh, Twitter? The, yeah? Well, if it's still around by the yeah. time we end. Yeah. What's, your, what's your Twitter handle? <laughs> uh, Ed Coates, or oh, there's the GameYourDatabase.com. Game um, GameYourDatabase.com. Yeah. Thank you. Leanne, where can we find I, you online? I literally deleted Twitter yesterday and I've never felt happier in my whole <laughs> life. Uh, so I'm no longer there. You can find me on Blue Sky. Um, and I believe I'm at Ikuyo, which you'll have to ask me how to spell. Um, and I'll say, <laughs> we search my name, um, spelt like that. There's very few Leanne Baileys with the misspelt Bailey, so you'll find me. Very good. Seb, uh, where can we find you? And where can we find Player Research? Yep, yeah, playerresearch.com for the business and sebastianlong.com for me. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. And I am Anissa Sanusi, your host for tonight, the founder of Limit Break at LB... Wait, what is my... my <laughs> at Limit Break, talk to me, no, you <laughs> And our socials are at LB Mentorship. And I am at Anissa Sanusi on everything. Wait, no, my, <laughs> my at is Studio Anissa on everything, including Blue Sky. I'm, I'm still on Twitter because that plays a dumpster fire and love it. <laughs> I'm there till the end, thinking with a ship. So thank you so much, everyone. And we, uh, Jonas, can you tell us how much longer do we have here before they kick us out? Well, before we worry about that, what I'd like to do is we're going to take a big group photo. <gasps> that's going to be with all of you. So what we're going to do for the group photo is I'm going to ask everyone um, in the audience to please come up to the stage and face that away towards that gentleman with the waving hands and camera. So if you want to stand in front of the stage, and if we have our speakers stay on the stage, everyone affiliated with Limit Break, please come up onto the stage as well. You could be a committee oh, member. Gosh. Um, or, or, or heavily affiliated with what's being spoken about today. Everyone get in front and we do a group photo. Uh, no. Oh, anywhere. anywhere. Yay. I feel like we're not tall enough. We're going to sneak Should up. Should we go a bit closer? Um, so, oh, God. Okay. Oh, my, microphone, my microphone nipple has fallen off. <laughs> Extra tall people should maybe be yes, tall people, yeah. people to the yeah. back. Okay, see that. Shorties at the front. That's fine. There we go. I'm healthily in the right, middle. All right, now, now please. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to to the front. Come on, hang on, come on. Please follow the instructions of of, of the man who's directing us in the front there. <laughs> outer humans. Should people outer sit? humans become people inner sit? humans. Can right outer there. humans become <laughs> inner humans, please? Stood on the side. No, don't do that. Uh, should people sit here? Yeah, step on the wall. There sit? we go. Gary, should people sit? At the front. Okay. Okay. How are you posing? No, I'm just holding it. Okay. 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 And everyone say the Samsung approved catchphrase. What is the catchphrase? Galaxy Air is here. <laughs> 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 okay. Are we saying it? Oh, it's Samsung. Samsung. Samsung.
<laughs> oh, by the way, guys, we do have um, Rollerdrome as well as Locomotive. Ed worked on Locomotive. I worked on Rollerdrome. If you want to play at the gaming bus on the side, there is there. Don't pay for Rollerdrome, please. Please pirate it. <laughs> but please wish list for Locomotive. It's coming out soon. Uh, and yeah, so we have half an hour. Till we have, yeah, we have until 9 p.m. in the venue. Um, if you're here after 9 p.m., you officially get locked into a three-year contract with a device you can't afford. Um, if, um, if, well, then you get three more. Um, if you are hungry or thirsty, um, there are loads of sweets just to the right over there um, and some white wine and some Coca-Cola. Please finish it because I don't want to take it home. Because <laughs> we don't, don't want to carry it, exactly. I'm a tiny uh, person. We have weak <laughs> arms. <laughs> Um, and that's it. Please, please stay until 9 p.m. and have a great time and yeah. network with each other. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. What's up?